Online. I'm delighted to say we have Colin O'Rourke, the Mead Football Manager, with us. Uh, Colin, good morning to you. How are you? Good morning. I'm just great. A bit easier uh, talking in the aftermath of a victory, I suspect, than it is after um, some defeat. So uh, I guess it's just like this is the other side of being a manager. You get to ease into the week a bit. Yes, uh, you have to, like Kipling, treat those two imposters just the same. Victory and defeat. With respect, Kipling never had to go up against, um, you know, the Division yeah. 2 in the Allianz Football Dublin. League. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's, uh, I think, you know, we were we, we were slated for getting our defeat at the hands of Dublin and Derry and the tactics and the open defence. It just shows, like, if you have good players, uh, I think the systems are secondary. You know, good players always overcome any opposition defence. And we saw that from both Derry and Dublin at the weekend. What what's your uh, feeling now on what it's like to be a manager versus what you thought it was going to be? Well, I've been involved uh, during in, in management at school level for forty years at club level, uh, involved with Simon's Town and Screen, and uh, involved in championship wins with both clubs at senior level. So I've seen a lot of it, but it definitely is different. It's more intense. It's more time consuming. But it's really, it's basically the same insofar as you're dealing with players and dealing with young people, which I also always found interesting and I learn a lot from them. I hope they learn something from me. We saw the difficulty some counties had, Column of, of getting a manager uh, during the summer, like it dragged on for months and months, some of these processes. And in my head, I guess a lot of it went, went down to the, the focus and the attention on the intercounty job. As you say, you can, you can have a club job and be somewhat under the radar, except for in your local area, but... There must be a, a pressure and, and social media backlash is another aspect of that as well that, that comes with the territory, unfortunately, of intercounty management. Yeah, there is a, a lot of that. There's a lot of focus and particularly in Mead, I think when a lot of people would uh, wonder what's gone wrong. It's not a job I really sought. In the end, I had my arm twisted. I didn't apply for it or anything like that. But uh, uh, the social media side, maybe i am sort of got a bit old for that and I, I still uh, lean on old-fashioned values that if I want to hear somebody's opinion, I'll probably call them or talk to them in person and I'm not that uh, very much into social media. I'm not on Twitter, not on any of these things. You know, for, for me, the people that count are the people that are my friends. I'm not really that pushed about the opinions of others who may wish to castigate me or any of the people involved or the players. Uh, I, I don't sort of get involved in that sort of thing. The players do though, right? I presume they do. I, I, it's something I don't speak to them very much about. They obviously come from a different generation and uh, uh, like there are very few people who aren't affected by a severe negative criticism. And I presume our players are like that as well. But uh, again, what we have tried to do is to build resilience and to try and get them to, to look at what's going on within their own lives and to grow as people and not to pass too rem much remarks on what's going outside uh, th their inner circle. Are you... Are you in this now for the long haul? Now that you've, you're in it, you're in it. I, I guess it would have been easy, or certainly, um, I don't think anybody would have blamed you if you had had an experience of it and decided, like, actually, you know what, I'm going to do this year and we'll revisit at the end. But it, the way you're talking recently about your team being young and building resilience, like you don't you don't show the fruits of that resilience in three months or six months. That takes that takes time to build a manifest. Yes, uh, that's absolutely right. Uh, I suppose like when I was studying economics long ago at college, uh, Keynes had a theory in the long run, we're all dead. So uh, the long haul for me is, I don't know, maybe three years to see how this would work. We definitely have decided to go with a young, uh, inexperienced team, six uh, debutants against Offaly in a, for a first championship match, three more last weekend. I think the... 12 of the team against Offaly had played uh, eight or nine championship matches or less. So it's very much a new team. would like to give them a chance to grow and develop. I do have confidence in them. The whole management team have confidence in them. But uh, the long haul, 
maybe a few years. I'm not really at an age where, you know, I'm not in my 30s or 40s or 50s where I could say, you know, it's somebody like Kieran McGinney or, or John Kiley or Brian Cody or Sean Boylan or somebody like that, that I'm going to be around for years. I do believe that if we're not able to see some real progress within a few years, then it's not working. Uh, and it might be time to let somebody else have a go. With that in mind, then, I suppose, when you, you were saying that, um, in a way, systems are secondary to the players you have, I guess that that's kind of... You're, you're in a period where you're building the players and ultimately... I'm wondering, will we actually see what your desired full system is until maybe the middle of next year? I, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, wishing away the future or anything, but actually, if you if you're still working out the quality of those players that you have, you haven't fully implemented your game plan around that yet. Uh, well, we have worked very hard on a defensive structure right from the very beginning, and uh, obviously, it depends on the players, and it has taken six months to get to know a lot of the players and obviously we would be in a much stronger position next year insofar as I would say that we'd know 90% of the panel probably before we started whereas we probably only knew 30 or 40% of it at this stage that are uh, coming up to Christmas this year but uh, uh, you know some people may have this sort of idea old-fashioned idea that I want to try and go back to the 1970s and 1980s to have a sort of long kicking game and that uh, it's a sort of a haven't kept up with the times anybody who's playing football now realizes that they have to have extra defenders that they have to have a, a very refined system in place yet when you look at the likes of Dublin last Sunday uh, I was in Crow Park and they still bring a huge element of long kicking to their game, which is very effective. But it's also balanced out with a very strong defensive system. So we're trying to build something for that. I'm not naive enough. I've uh, been involved with playing sweepers at club level for many years when we won the championship here with Simonstown. So we want to try and get something that everybody is comfortable and that they're able to do. You mentioned you were at that match, Cullum, um, an 18th Leinster crown in 19 seasons for Dublin, 13th in a row. I mean, if you'd said at the start of the, the year that the, the Leinster final would finish five goals and 21 points to 15 points, there'd be a lot of rolled eyes. And, and Desi Farrell's comments after the match were, were interesting enough. He says it's probably time to have a proper review of the competition and see who benefits from these big wins, the big discrepancies between teams. Is there a better mixture? I don't know if you had any views on, on Desi's comments and, and on the future of the Leinster Championship, I suppose, in general. Yeah, well, I, uh, like, I think Desi Farrell said quite correctly that uh, the real competition starts now. And uh, like Dublin, an exceptional team, I felt sorry for Loud. Like they're coming up against some of the best players I have ever seen in the 50 odd years that I've been going to inter county football. But uh, like the, the Leinster uh, Championship is dead. And that's off, that, that can be put down to Mead's own competitiveness too, because. Uh, in the 80s and 90s, it often was uh, a two-team championship at that stage. And then, of course, Kildare and Leash and Westmead came in with wins at different times. But the absence of, of a competitive mead has certainly been a, a huge disadvantage to the Leicester Championship. And the way the structure runs now, like all provincial championships are not really of any great importance anymore. Uh, as Desi Farrell did say, the real competition starts now with the groups of four. And to me, the whole thing is is a bit of a farce going from a league structure to a championship structure, back to a league structure with the rounds of four, and then on to another championship structure. Uh, I think it's very demanding of players. This restricted season, the split season, is certainly good for clubs. But if you're an inter-county player, there is no split season and uh, I, I see huge demands on players, a lot of injuries. To win the All-Ireland, a team may have to win 17 or 18 competitive matches during the year. I think it's too much. I think that uh, the player going back to his club after this will be spun out. And it just, me, uh, it just uh, that I have the height of respect for somebody like Conor Glass who has gone from county to club and back to county and is a star man it's just a wonderful player to be able to do it. But I think there are very few Connor classes. I think a lot of county players after the season is over now are going to need a long break. It, it, to, as a kinder argument to that and almost to play devil's advocate, do players maybe prefer playing matches to, to slogging out in training? 
Oh, yeah, it's absolutely no doubt about that. But there's a limit to it. You know, fellas still have to get up on Monday and go to work or go to college and things like that. And there's both physical and mental demands on them. So if you're with a, a successful club, it means a, a more or less 12-month season. And that's 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 too demanding. We did want to ask you about um, comments from, from Donal Cusick as well. The Talton Cup kicked off the weekend, as you, as Jer mentioned, 119 to 11 point win. <laughs> you yes. know where I'm going with this, but uh, he, he did mention the Talton Cup by name. Um, so he said it's a sort of Gaelic football grand national for disappointed also rans. Um, what did you make of Donal Logue's comments? Oh, well, I, I, I made the comment that I wouldn't pass too much remarks in that. Like, imagine me making comments like that about the Christy Ring or Nicky Rackard or Laurie Mara Cup. Like, I see the mead hurlers that played before us on Saturday and they're out in Dungani training and putting in similar effort to us. I wouldn't denigrate or run down a second-tier hurling competition or a third-tier hurling competition. And, you know, there there is a sort of... Uh, a type of sort of elitist snobbery with some hurling people who think that hurling is the greatest game on earth and I think that it should be shown on television and promoted. I don't know where this comes from, you know. Uh, people like that are better off if they, instead of having rehearsed rants on radio and television, be better off down in their club doing a bit of work at juvenile level. Uh, hurling is a wonderful game and there's no doubt about it. As a spectacle, it's fantastic. So is Gaelic football. Like, look at the Ulster final and the tension of it last Sunday. So is basketball. So is rugby. Like, La Rochelle and Leinster on Saturday, I'm sure, will be wonderful. The World Cup final between France and Argentina or tomorrow, tomorrow night, Man City and Real Madrid and uh, baseball and basketball. I love all those sports and cricket as well. Who's to decide who's the greatest game? I wonder who's the judge of that. Maybe golf is the greatest game of all. It can be played by anybody anywhere in the world almost from 9 to 90 and you can play at, at any level and the handicap system means that uh, everybody is equal. So I'm not into this sort of making comments about other sports. Everybody deserves equal respect. Uh, the Talchon Cup uh, is, is a flawed competition, but it is a great competition for, for those who haven't got into the All-Ireland. But there are very many flaws in it. Uh, not, notwithstanding the flaws and, and how many teams are actually going to make it and how many games we have to go through to get to the point where um, we essentially throw out five of the um, uh, 16 who are left the win that you had at the weekend must have been a massive release of pent up emotion for your crew it's been a while since you've actually had a victory and the, the uh, programme that the team took after the Offaly game um, what was that dressing room like for you guys afterwards? Oh, it was a very happy dressing room, but I, I don't know. I've been I've been lucky insofar we have a very committed group of players, and after the Offaly game, like they they all stuck at it, and we're back at training within the week. So it's been fortunate in that regard that I have been lucky to be involved with a very very good group. But it's nice to see smiles on people's faces after a game, and they needed a bit of confidence and and they worked hard and. Uh, Things turned out well for them, but uh, they worked hard for it, so they got what they deserved. Yeah, you can see things turn around pretty quickly for teams. I, I two last quick things I wanted to talk to you about. You, you obviously would have been an interested observer watching the the GA Go situation. Uh, what what was your instinct about that? Was it like because I think the football crowd are going to realise over the next couple of weeks that oh, it wasn't just the hurting crowd who are missing all the good games. Actually, yeah, uh, we're going to miss some too. What well, what's your instinct about that whole thing? I'm old enough to go back to us and to remember when there was very little football and hurling on television and now we've come to a stage where some people think they should be able to see everything. I don't see that as a big issue at all. Uh, I think it's a non-event. Like if somebody wants to pay 79 quid or whatever it is and have access to every game, I think that's good value. Like it's not too many people are were able to see all these big hurling matches a few years ago anyway. So I don't know where this clamour is coming from to, that everything should be put free to air. If there's three or four matches on at the weekend, I think that's sufficient coverage. And of course, the more games are on television, the more it hits local club games as well. So you have to take into account that side of it as well. I don't see it as a, a big issue. I Maybe those who are 
uh, doing the the scheduling for GEA Go, did pull a fast one and decide that, you know, they'd put on a few very attractive matches on a paywall. Maybe that was done. But, uh, like, the, for years and years, there have been big games with nobody that nobody could see. And just because they turned out to be brilliant games doesn't, doesn't mean that they should be automatically free to air. There's been a lot of very poor Munster Championship matches and poor games everywhere. You can't just uh, decide in advance we're going to show a game just because we think it's going to be a classic. The last thing was um, the other two thirds of the Holy Trinity Splan and Brawley have both recently talked about how the kind of joy had gone out of being a pundit. Was that your experience too? A little bit. Uh, I, I think it has become a little bit sanitised and uh, I, I think that you need somebody to bring a bit of colour and wit and enthusiasm and maybe, you know, I, I always thought that you needed to give an opinion that people sitting at home would say, well, I think he's a bloody idiot or I agree with that or something, but not to give something that everybody else could see. So I think Mr. Brawley is a big loss to television and sort and Pat Spillane as well. I think they're a loss insofar as uh, they give fairly uh, uh, forthright comments and people had an opportunity to agree or disagree with them. But like if everybody agrees with something and we all say the same thing, it's a pretty boring type of game and boring life in general. Fair enough. Colm, enjoy the rest of the summer. Thanks a million for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye.